We are very blessed here in this congregation. One of the uh, great blessings that we have, our elders here at Linder Road, uh, determine every year to make sure that we have both a ladies' retreat and a men's retreat. Sometimes our retreats are not retreats. We're like for our men's rally, we just stayed here, so we didn't really retreat anywhere, but we, we came together here. Uh, so first of all, let me just say thank you to our elders for, for making sure that happens every year. That is, that's, that's so vital. It's so important. Uh, we met together Friday night and then yesterday up through lunchtime. We had, uh, at one point Friday night, it's, some of the numbers got a little, I think got a little smaller tomorrow. We had 80 guys here Friday night. We had several men from our sister congregations throughout the valley, which was an incredible blessing. That, 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 was, that was so encouraging to see that those guys coming from Fruitland and from Nampa and from other places to come, come be with us for the weekend. Uh, and I want to say personally, thank you to all, all you guys who, who, who attended and specifically for all you guys who helped with the setup and cleanup and all the different things. Uh, the, when we wrapped up yesterday, several men jumped in and we got everything cleaned up in not too much time. And I want to say specifically thank you to my wife, Kara, for I had several guys tell me how the, you know, the, the fellowship hall looked all nice, like I had anything to do with that. Uh, Kara helped set up, helped get some of the, the food prepared for, for yesterday morning in particular. So I very much appreciate her help or we'd have just plain plastic tables and a box of donuts. <clears throat> Our speaker for the weekend was, is, was, and is still Darren Williamson. Uh, Darren is, is a, a man that I've been able to get to know a little bit over the last four or five years and just have been so impressed with his, his approach to ministry, his approach to leadership. Um, Darren comes to us from the Southwest Congregation in Tigard, Oregon. He is an, an, a native of the Northwest. He grew up in, born in Oregon, raised in Washington, spent some time being, uh, pursuing his education in British Columbia. So it, it's, it, it's a great connection that he has with our area, which is an, another very encouraging thing. Darren is the uh, director of the Northwest School of Discipleship that the the Tigard Cur or the Southwest Congregation runs over there in Tigard, and uh, Darren told us a little bit about that during our our Bible class. Darren has been in ministry for over thirty years, uh, and I, I just want I read this to the guys yesterday. I want to read the bio he provided for me. Most importantly, this is what he says. Most importantly, he is striving himself to grow as a disciple of Jesus and to be a good husband to his wife, Melody, and a loving father to his eight children. If you've gotten to know Darren at all over this weekend, gentlemen, you, you, you've you seen that reflected in the words that he says, the, the demeanor that he shares with us. So at this time, Brother Darren, come preach to us. Well, good morning, church. I bring you greetings from the, the elders, the deacons, the ministers, and the saints at the Southwest Church of Christ in Tigard, Oregon. I'm very glad to be here this morning, very glad to be here this whole weekend. It's been really enjoyable, and I feel like I've got a, a, a deeper connection with a, a very strong congregation in the Northwest now here at Linda Road. I uh, just got back last week, last Friday night at about midnight, um, from Cambodia. And as uh, Clint mentioned, I'm the director of the School of Discipleship there, and we have a gap year program for 18 to 22 year olds. And we were originally going to go to Israel for our mission trip, right? You know, Israel over there. But then something happened in October, and so we had to switch gears. And we looked and we discovered, and God really put in front of us a great opportunity to go to Cambodia and work with a ministry called Cambodia Christian Ministries that's doing a wonderful work there. And so we worked with them for a couple weeks, and we got back last Friday night and then uh, off to the races doing other things as well. And so on the right picture there, you see uh, the students that we took to Cambodia. On the left side, you see a bunch of the kids that we taught uh, for six days and, or longer and uh, just really had a great ministry there. But um, one of the things that happens, you know, whenever you take international flights, something's going to happen, right? You, you guys get that, right? Something's going to happen. 
somebody's going to get sick, some, some flight's going to get delayed, or something. And I'm happy to say that the worst thing that happened was, for me, this, okay? And that is when we got on the flight in Seattle, because we flew out of Seattle, better flights, cheaper flights, whatever. Um, everybody settles into their, their seat, and everybody's playing around with their video. They're going to watch movies. They're going to play games. They're going to, you know, watch the altitude of the airplane, you know, and all the different things you get to do. It's kind of exciting, right? And then they go through the whole thing about, you know, in the event of the unlikely event of a crash or, or losing oxygen or whatever, you know, the, the masks come down and then we see this picture. Well, my screen got stuck on this picture. And so for the next 13 hours, every time I woke up from my slumbers and my sleep, these two were staring at me, okay? <laughs> and yes, I know, you can try to get it changed. They did. They tried to reboot it. It wouldn't work, okay? And so this is what I looked at for 13 hours whenever I would look up. So I thought I would share that with you today. <laughs> thought about maybe leaving it up the entire sermon, right? So <laughs> see what you think about it. But, um, but what's ironic about it is that in my discipleship courses that I do for helping people be disciples... I actually use the illustration of the oxygen mask coming down. It's one of my big points. And so I thought, well, maybe God is wanting me to share that in a broader place. And so this is going to factor in later in the sermon, but that idea of put on your mask before assisting children. Okay. So it was a good trip. Everything went well. And I was so happy to finish up this year of discipleship training with these nine young people and the text that I was thinking of as I was wrapping up this program with them is from 1 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 16. So I want to share that with you this morning. And one of the reasons this text came to mind is because right in the middle of it, Paul tells Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And these young people that I worked with, I, I pray and I hope that I help them grow spiritually, but what's great about the kingdom is that they, they helped me. They were examples to me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning in this time and this space to hear from you. May your word come forth, go out from this pulpit into this space into our ears, into our hearts, into our minds, and change us. May it go forth and achieve the purposes that you have for it this morning. May we be attentive to your word. May we be open in heart and mind. May we find comfort in it. May we find challenges. May we find exhortation. May we find rebuke. May we find correction, Lord. Whatever you want to happen this morning, open our ears and our hearts and our minds. It's in Christ's holy name that I pray. Amen. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself 
and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I love 1 Timothy. It is a wonderful, short little book of the New Testament that's packed full of wonderful messages for the body of Christ. And we have this little letter because Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. He was going on a little bit further up to to Macedonia. Ephesus is in Asia Minor. He left him there because there was some false teaching that needed to be dealt with, and Paul went on to Macedonia. And then some things were happening, and Paul writes this letter back to him to give him some encouragement, to give him some instruction, to help him maybe... um, answer some questions that Timothy might not have understood complete yet, but he gets this letter from his mentor, Paul, that give him wonderful instruction. Timothy was probably in his late 20s or early 30s when he received this letter. And he writes it as a follow-up and provides specific teaching about how to deal with some things in Ephesus. And in the process, we get a lot of teaching about the nature of the Christian ministry. We get information about the good governance of the church, that is, elders and deacons and ministers. We see important information about what worship is supposed to be like and who's supposed to be leading in the assembly of the saints. We also get detailed instructions about taking care of widows. And in the midst of all of this instruction that's applicable for the entire church at Ephesus and beyond... Paul several times pauses and he speaks directly to Timothy and he encourages him as all ministers need encouragement. And every minister in this place, everybody who's served in a ministry role, you know you need encouragement because it gets hard sometimes. And he stops and he encourages him and he gives him this exhortation in chapter 4 that's powerful. He's a good servant. And he's to put these teachings before the brothers. Don't hold back. Lay it out before them, Timothy. Let the chips fall where they may. And we can only assume and trust that Timothy did just that. He did not hold back. The most important, significant thing about this section, literarily, literally, okay, in terms of literature, okay, is the number of commands. If you were to count them, you would see, let's see if it shows up here. Okay, a little bit easier. There are 12 commands to Timothy in these 11 verses. Can you believe that? 12 commands to this young man. It's like rapid fire. I mean, this is like the, you know, bam, 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 do this, do this, do this, do that to this young minister. Have nothing to do with myths, verse 7. Train yourself for godliness. Command these things. Teach these things. Let no one despise your youth. Set an example. Devote yourself to Scripture. Do not neglect your gift. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. Keep watch on yourself. Persist in it. Lots of commands. You see, there's a sense of urgency, a sense of authority, a sense of seriousness about the work he has sent Timothy there to do. And that's one of the reasons I love 1 Timothy. It's a serious, intense, urgent letter. Because there's stuff to be done. There's souls to be saved. There's churches to be equipped. There's families to be strengthened. There's false doctrine that needs to be corrected. False doctrine is not uh, neutral. It harms people. It leads people astray into myths and all kinds of weird stuff. And we need to get back to the sound, healthy teaching of the gospel. Not all the sideshows that people love to get into because their sinful imaginations love to run off into mythology. You see, there's a sense of urgency to Timothy. There's a sense of urgency to us today in a culture that's confused, in a culture that's completely off the rails, in a culture that now has rejected Christianity, having once had this faith in its midst. It shaped its institutions. It shaped its form of government. It shaped its laws. It shaped its culture for a couple hundred years. And now our culture is saying, forget about it. 
As I mentioned yesterday, we went from having, um, when some of you were young, you prayed in schools. Can you believe that? And now Christianity is considered by the broader culture as a negative thing, a harmful thing. They're the haters. And now more than ever, Christians, we've got to get serious about our faith. Amen? I mean, it's serious. Nominal Christianity, pew-packing Christianity, won't cut it anymore. Not in a hostile environment. We will see people fade away, fall away, slip away, drift away, paddle away, all those kinds of ways, unless we strengthen their faith and get them firm and sound in doctrine and sound in a relationship with Jesus Christ that's way deeper than just nominal Christianity. Speaking of doctrine, in this text, there are two powerful doctrines that I think are worth noting. He actually just mentions them kind of in passing, but I want to stop and linger on them a little bit. Because sometimes we get um, caught up in the, in the, the nuance of a text, the, the weeds of a text, and forget to back up and look at what is the big picture that's there. And there are two major doctrines that Paul refers to in the midst of this, these 12 exhortations to Timothy. The first one is this. There is a life to come. Physical training is good for this life, but godliness is good for both this life and the life to come. And it struck me as a simple yet profound teaching that we need to remember in our modern, secular, materialistic world. You see, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, visitors, whoever is here in the midst of this assembly, the Bible teaches that there is more to reality than what we are currently experiencing. This physical existence that we have now is not all there is. In fact, what we are experiencing now in this short span, 70, if by strength 75, maybe if you're really strong, 80, 85 years, is nothing compared to the life to come. And what you do with this short life that you have now determines where you will spend eternity. And so remembering that from time to time is of the essence. Because we go through this life so fast. We're, we're raising kids. We're getting a job. We go to school. We got this. We're got, buying our first car. We're doing all this other stuff, going through life. And we're forgetting that, hey, there's another life coming. Are you preparing for that life? Are you as focused on the life to come as you are focused on things in this existence? What's your five-year career plan and all those kinds of things? Are, are you focused? Are you thinking about that life? There's a good chance that some of us here are not thinking about that. Uh, a few weeks ago, or a few months ago actually, um, a young man that I was visiting with was telling me that his father was pushing him real hard about his career goals. Hey, what are you going to be doing in five years? I mean, what's your career, what, what's your retirement plan going to look like? Are you saving? Are you investing? Are you putting stuff aside? What about your real estate investment? All this kind of stuff. And what was ironic was that that same father, living in open rebellion and sin against God, pushing so hard for his son to think about what he's going to do in retirement, while all along ignoring what he's going to do when he takes his last breath and where he will be when judgment day comes. A classic example of the guy who's building the barns. He wants a bigger barn to store his stuff in, and he focuses so much on that, and Jesus in the parable says, you know, don't you know that tonight your life is demanded of you? So don't just be rich in this world, but be rich to God in the things to come. And so, brothers and sisters, I think we've got to remember this as we go through this text, as we go through our Christian life. Remember, uh, yes, it's good to, to plan for retirement, Yes, it's planned to do some financial planning, but don't forget to plan for the life to come. It's more valuable. Did you know that if you die in this world as a pauper, 
with no retirement, living in a trailer park someplace, but you have Jesus, you have it all. You really do. And the person living in the big house by the golf course that doesn't know Jesus has nothing. Well, he has something in the life to come. But we won't talk about what that is. Torment, punishment, away from the presence of God for eternity. And so let us be people who never forget there is a life to come. The second doctrine that we see taught here, the second bullet point up there, is that there's only one Savior. He mentions this almost again in passing. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, verse 9, for to this we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Do we understand that? Do we understand that Christianity and Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus, the message of salvation is a message of salvation The message that there is a Savior and only one. Do we get that? It sounds very exclusive in a modern pluralistic world. Where you go to Walmart and you got 20 different choices for, her, for chocolate on your ice cream or different cho- ice cream. We're used to so many different choices when it comes to religion. How do you go to heaven? Um, one. Yes, I know there's Hinduism that has thousands of gods ways of getting out of the cycle of reincarnation. I know that there's Buddhism. I Believe me, we were there in Cambodia. 90-something percent of the people are Buddhists. They have temples all over the place. And there's various pathways to God. And they try to find, well, if Hinduism doesn't work for you, try Buddhism. And then most of the people have what these, they call spirit houses outside their homes where they placate the local demons and try to keep them off of their case and help them bring good things to them. And you try various options for protecting yourself spiritually. But the Bible teaches boldly and our world would say arrogantly that there's only one way. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And the church went out proclaiming this. There's no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. The apostles say in Acts chapter 4 verse 12. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, there's only one God and there's one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. Friends, neighbors, brothers, sisters, let us never forget that Jesus Christ is not a Savior. He's the Savior. Let me say that again. He's not a Savior. He's the Savior. There's no other. But what a wonderful Savior He is. What a wonderful, loving Savior. Savior he is, who gave himself completely for us, sufficiently poured out his blood for us. And he's worth our devotion. He's worth our commitment. He's worth following. He's someone you can trust when you devote your life to him. It's not a matter of, well, can he really handle the stuff I got in my life? Of course he can. He's God in flesh, who died upon the cross, who humbled himself completely to save us. And now he's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and one day he's going to return. Do you think he can help you with the troubles you got in your marriage and your family and your house and all that stuff? Absolutely. He's worth following. And let us never forget that, brothers and sisters. And then finally, in this text, there is some specific things. And now I want to go through all 12 exhortations. No, okay, I won't do that, all right? I thought I might catch some of you on that. No, it's too many. There's 12, and we've, we've, we've got to get to some things quickly here. They're all worthy of reflection. Young people, it's worthy of reflection that Timothy was told as a young, don't let people look down on you because you're young, but be an example. Did you know that you can be an example to older people, younger, younger folks? You can be. You can be an example to them. You need to respect your elders. But um, they can, you can be an example to them. By the way, when I was in Cambodia, it was really interesting because there they have a very strong respect for older people in the culture. 
and we were teaching the kids up on, you know, to write certain phrases. So uh, we had them say, you know, my name is such and such, and I am so many years old. And so I wrote my name up on the board. My name is Darren Williamson. I am 52 years old. And before I could get it written down, they all started clapping for me like this. Because I was 52. Wow, you made it. Wow, that's pretty great. <laughs> You're old. Okay, I'm not sure how I felt about that. But anyway, it was, it was fun, you know, to see that. There's a great respect for the elders. But you also remember that there is a way that you can instruct and help the older people who maybe are tired and maybe who've been through a lot. And maybe when they look at your faith and your excitement and your dedication and your speech and your conduct and your love and your faith, it inspires them in their faith. We could maybe talk about that, but instead I want to talk about two things as we wrap up here. To exhort you this morning as brothers and sisters in Christ, number one, train yourself for godliness. When it comes to applying this passage, this is the one to me that jumps out the most. Verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. Holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Godliness is that character trait of a person who's completely sold out for God. You think about God, you love God, you serve God, you honor God, you glorify God, you're all about God. And everything about him, you want to know. Everything that he's called you to do, I want to do that. And it, but it takes effort. We are not naturally going to be godly people. We have to work at it. We are saved by grace. We are saved by God's great love and favor toward all those who will trust in his son, Jesus Christ. But when you want to grow in godliness, you've got to put skin in the game. You've got to put effort into it. You've got to train. And all of you who go to the gym or or run a triathlon, or run a 5K, or whatever, you understand the concept of training, right? No pain, no gain. Thank you. All right, we're awake. You understand that. You know that the Greek word that he uses here for training is the word we get the word gymnasium from. Gymnase, right? Some, you train. Brothers and sisters, we've got to be godly, and we have to be training for it. The world is pushing us to godlessness. We've got to be training for godliness. And it's going to take effort. And it's going to take some intensity. And it's going to take some seriousness. And Paul says, you know, hey, physical training is of some value. But training in godliness is worth a lot more. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today, in a culture that has elevated sports to almost a god, to train at least as much for godliness as you are focused on your sports. At least as much. You go to the gym five days a week, great. Hour, hour workout, are you spending that much time with Christ? And in his word, training for righteousness and godliness, if not, then you need to repent and you need to spend time in training for godliness because it has value for this life and for the life to come. Take a look at how much you spend on your training for your physical body. You drop $150 on new running shoes, but you won't pay any money to go to church camp. You've got your priorities wrong. Think about the time you spend trying to make this mortal body not break down as fast. And realize that you need, I need to be focused at least as much and more on training for godliness. Or you'll never grow. You'll never have victory. You'll keep falling into the same sin over and over and over again. And I'm focused on guys because that's what we did this past weekend. But a lot of guys, they keep falling into sin because you're simply not training for righteousness. You're not training for godliness. So start doing it. Finally, keep watch on yourself. This last thing that Timothy said, or Paul says to Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. In order to grow spiritually, 
you've got to do some self-evaluation. You've got to keep a close watch on yourself. And this is especially something that is important for leaders to remember, for parents to remember as you're training your kids and helping them be godly and helping them follow Jesus. Are you taking care of yourself spiritually first? Like we see up on the screen, put your own mask on first before helping children. Did you know that if you're not spiritually healthy, moms, dads, you're not going to be able to help your kids spiritually? Elders, do you know that if you're not spiritually growing and you're not robust in your faith, you're not going to be able to help the sheep because you won't have anything to give. And so fill yourself up with the Word of God. Keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching because by doing so, you're going to help yourself, but you're also going to help those who are your hearers. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Christian leaders who are falling later in life. I'm tired of it. I don't want to see that happen anymore. And that's one of the reasons I've got this on here as an exhortation. If you are a spiritual leader of your family, of this church or another church or whatever, keep a close watch on yourself. When you fall, others fall too. That's part of the burden of leadership. So keep watch on yourself and keep growing, keep strong, be an example of training for godliness. As I said, brothers and sisters, it's nominal, weak Christianity is not going to make it in this culture. You got to be strong. You got to be filled with word, the word of God. You, have, you can't just get by on a little prayer every day. You got to be men and women of prayer dwelling in God's presence. That's what's going to make it. That's what's going to help us win back this culture. That's what's going to help us stay faithful for the long haul. That's what's going to help us make disciples of all nations. But it's going to take some training. May that be our, uh, what we end up doing. Whatever, your mess, whatever the message for you this morning is, if there's something in this that's convicted you, maybe you're someone who needs to repent of sin, maybe your priorities have been way out of whack, and you just need to pray over that, I'll be willing to pray with you. Or maybe you're someone who you need to pray with one of the elders here. Maybe you're someone who has been putting off baptism. You've been kind of thinking about it, kind of wondering whether or not it's really something you need to do. Well, you need to. There is a life to come, and you have no guarantees of when that will be, whether that's tonight or tomorrow or next week or whatever. When the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns at the head of a large army of angels, you want to be standing there ready to receive him, not wishing you had been baptized when you had an opportunity to do it. So this may be an opportunity for you to put on Jesus Christ in baptism. Maybe you're someone that's just got some other issue that you want to have prayer over. This is an opportunity to make that known as we stand and as we sing. So let's stand and let's sing.